If you need a Bible uh, while the kids are evacuating the sanctuary, if you need a Bible, there's some on that back table there. Like I said a second ago, we are in Revelation chapter 10, which means we have verse by verse made it through the first nine chapters of Revelation. We're almost to the middle of the book. Of course, we've made it to Revelation by going verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the Bible. So um, that's pretty cool. All right, to this point, there has been a, uh, a, just a ton of information, right? Um, so let's, let's take a few minutes to review, since we are at the midpoint, or getting closing in on the midpoint of this book. Let's take some time to review where we've been so we can better understand where we're going. Um, in chapter 1, John, who has been exiled to the prison island of Patmos, sees Jesus in his resurrected and glorified state. In verse 19 of chapter 1, he is told by Jesus to write the things which he has seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Now, as we observed in our preparation for studying this letter, back when we did our introduction, that verse gave us the outline for this book. The things which he has seen, that is the resurrected, glorified Jesus, and that was covered in the first chapter. The things which are is the church age. We are in that time right now. Uh, the age um, which started with the birth of the church and lasts until the rapture of the church, which I believe will be at the uh, very beginning of the tribulation there, just prior to the beginning of the tribulation. Um, now, John covers that period in chapters 2 and 3 with the seven letters to the seven churches. And then we have the things which will take place after this, and that is the majority of this, this letter. Um, that is the tribulation, which begins with the rapture of the church and is covered by the remainder of this book, dealing with what is still future. Now, how far into the future? We don't really know, at least seven years, right? Um, Jesus could return for his church at any moment, any time now. Um, in fact, according to the Bible, we should be expecting his at any moment return. Uh, the Bible says in James 5, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Um, all the way in, in chapter 1 of Revelation, uh, we read this in verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And again, later on in chapter 22 of Revelation, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Um, in our introduction to Revelation, we talked about the doctrine of imminence, which is, is put very simply is uh, Christians are to live in expectation of Jesus' any moment appearance for us. And, and that led us to recognize that Revelation was written to a certain group of people for specific reasons. It's perhaps a, a good reminder for us as we continue to study through this book. We're starting to read and investigate some incredible imagery, some fantastic things, and the danger is that we could get distracted from the actual intent of this letter. So let's remember a few things that we dealt with when we first started the study. And first, the letter was written to believers. Believers in the late 1st and 2nd century AD, but obviously it's for all Christians. Secondly, this letter was written to assure believers of the ultimate triumph of Christ over all who come against him and his saints. The focus of this book is not the Antichrist. It's not the beast. It's not the mark of the beast. It's not demonic locusts. It's not world wars. It's not any of those things. The focus is Jesus Christ. And as Jesus told the Apostle John in Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so John introduced the letter to us in chapter 1, sharing with us the vision that was shared with him from Jesus. Now the second point in the outline that Jesus gave to John is in chapters 2 through 3, those seven letters to the seven churches, letters from Jesus Christ himself, the things which are. 
Those letters address concerns in seven particular churches at that time, and those things are still concerns for the church today, so we need to heed the things that Jesus said in those letters. Uh, we had a great time investigating each of those seven churches and, and the letters that were written to them, the setting that, that they were written into, the, the setting that those churches existed in, um, what Jesus' words to them were about. And if you missed all that, then I would definitely advise you to go and listen to the podcast or, or watch those videos. There's, there's just so much information packed in there, really too much for us to hit on any kind of, uh, any kind of review this morning. Um, before we get into chapter 10, now, there, you'll, you can find links to the, the YouTube channel or our podcast at calvarybirmingham.com backslash on demand if you uh, are so interested. Now, after the seven letters to the seven churches, John looks and it says, And behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. This is the beginning of that third section of the outline that Jesus gave to the Apostle John, the things which will take place after this. This, second, this section is the largest part of the book, uh, starting here with John's rapture up to heaven and spanning the whole rest of this letter. So called up to heaven, John sees the Father on the throne with 24 elders seated on thrones around him. The throne is... Uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the Tabernacle of the Holy of Holies. The 24 elders are the priests who ministered in the Tabernacle and later the Temple, but here they're probably the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Seven lamps of fire were, were before the throne and, and a sea of glass like crystal. The seven lamps speak of the menorah which stood in the holy place before the veil which separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. But the veil was removed, spiritually speaking, when Jesus died on that cross. So we find no veil here between the seven lamps and the throne of God. In fact, we saw again later with the altar of incense, no veil and Jesus, our high priest, acting as our mediator. The author of Hebrews wrote this in Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the, holy, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The sea of glass that was pictured there was most likely what was referred to later during the time of Solomon's temple as the molten sea, but with the tabernacle was the bronze laver. This is where, according to Exodus 30, the priest would wash his hands and, uh, and his feet to be clean before approaching the altar or before entering the tabernacle. And the text there in, in Exodus says, lest he die. In John 13, Jesus said to Peter, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Here we have a, a literal sea of glass, not a bowl or a basin to wash in. The sea of glass reminds us that the washing that comes by Jesus is total and it is complete. Also around the throne are four mysterious living creatures full of eyes in front and back. and like, One like a lion, one like an ox, one like an eagle, and one with a face like a man. Illustrations of, of cherubim were found in the tapestry of the tabernacle and in the veil. And that's not all. The imagery of chapter 4 is, is, is just amazing. Again, if, if you missed it, go back and listen to that podcast or watch that video. All of this is there. Now, in chapter 5, the father who is on the throne holds in his right hand a seven-sealed book, a seven-sealed scroll, and, and a mighty angel asks, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Now John then wept long and hard because no one came forward who was worthy to open the scroll. And he knew that, that contained in that scroll were events that would bring about the ultimate redemption of all creation. And no champion was stepping forward to unseal it. John is then told to, that he could stop weeping because the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed and is worthy to open the scroll. So then John turns to see this lion, but instead there was a lamb, a lamb looking as if it had been slain. This champion, our champion, is Jesus. 
So in chapter 5, the champion stepped forward to open the seven seals of the scroll, and that champion, Jesus, uh, begins to open those seals. And the first seal brings the Antichrist riding a white horse, and he is bent on world conquest. Daniel 7.23 says that he will rule a future kingdom that will devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The second seal brings worldwide conflict. The Antichrist who, who sold this idea of, of a promise of peace. Instead, he brings worldwide war. The third seal brings famine, which often follows war. And this is the worldwide, worldwide war resulting in worldwide famine. And when the fourth seal is open, a quarter of the population of the world dies. With the fifth seal, there are martyrs crying out for justice. And when the sixth seal is open, the heavens and the earth are shaken. Chapter 6 ended with the remaining people of the world hiding in caves and wedging themselves into crevices and mountains to hide from God's wrath. And then in chapter 7, we saw a multitude of Jews and Gentiles saved during this awful time. And this reminds us of Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 where it says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. That was written during a time period when Israel was divided. The northern kingdom of Israel was already in captivity at that point to the Assyrians. In the southern kingdom, there was a string of corrupt kings, and the kingdom itself was corrupted with idolatry and rebellion against God. And the question on Habakkuk's heart was, Lord, I know that we deserve your wrath, but in the midst of your wrath... Will you remember mercy? Another question Habakkuk had for God was, why do you not judge this wickedness? Now today there are a great number of people who feel the same way. God, where are you? Why, are you, why, why do you seem so silent in the face of everything that's going on today, all the violence of our time? Well, God informed Habakkuk that he was going to use Babylon to punish the southern kingdom of Judah, but this left Habakkuk with a couple of questions. Why would, why would you, God, use a nation who is decidedly more wicked to punish Israel? And again, that, that question we asked a second ago, will the Lord remember mercy and revive us? And God then revealed that he was using Babylon to judge Israel, but he would also judge Babylon. I, I like what Martin Luther wrote regarding this book. In the name of the, of the prophet Habakkuk means to embrace. But Martin Luther wrote this, Habakkuk signifies an embracer or one who embraces another, takes him into his arms. He embraces his people and takes them to his arms. He comforts them and holds them up as one embraces a weeping child to quiet with the assurances that if God wills, it shall soon be better. I think, I think that what really uh, uh, pings for me here is that even in his judgment, there is this promise of mercy. And specific to our study of Revelation, that which seems to be doom and gloom because of the mercy of God ends in glory. Now at this point in the opening of the seals, things are so desperate on the earth, the judgments are so severe that we wondered how it could be that there are more judgments to come, trumpet judgments and bowl judgments. And the answer to that is this. The events that accompany the opening of the seals, they give us a wide-angle panorama of the whole tribulation. And then what follows after that are detailed snapshots. Now, continuing on with our review to this point, chapter 8 is the opening of that final seal, seal number 7. And when that seal is opened, there is, there is silence in heaven for about half an hour. And it's the greatest calm before the greatest storm in all of history. The seventh seal reveals seven angels standing before God, and they have seven trumpets to sound. The first trumpet brings hail and fire mixed with blood, and a third of the earth is burned up, a third of the trees are burned up, and all the green grass is burned up. The second trumpet brings something like a huge burning mountain that is thrown into the sea. 
One third of the sea turns to blood, a third of the creatures in the sea die, and a third of the ships are destroyed. The third trumpet brings a great blazing star that falls on a third of the rivers and, and springs of water. The star is called wormwood, which means bitter. And many people die from the waters that have now become bitter. Now we should take note that wormwood does not refer to wood that has been uh, eaten up by worms. It, it's specifically a very bitter tasting plant that could make a person sick in a large amount. The plant wormwood is, it's in fact the second most bitter plant in the world. It contains an ingredient which in large, in large quantities is poisonous. So what does a, a bitter plant have to do with meteors? Well, when meteors enter the Earth's atmosphere and start to burn, they're called meteorites. And in the United States, we commonly call them shooting stars. When a large meteorite hits the Earth's surface, it raises up a cloud of dust. And if the meteorite is large enough, the dust and the particles in that cloud, they spread around the globe. And they are moved by the winds and the rotation of the Earth. Wormwood contained a contaminant that turned one-third of the Earth's fresh water bitter or somehow released pollutants on the Earth that, that contaminate a third of the fresh water. Now, in the Old Testament, wormwood was used as a metaphor for idolatry, for calamity and sorrow. So then the star's name identifies that its effects were judgment on man for idolatry and injustice. In the time of the Bible, idolatry primarily referred to worship of idols or, or graven images, though some actually do today. Most people, uh, well, I don't know, because some places are very highly populated where they, they still worship idols like that, statues and things, but most in the West here probably do not worship an actual statue or an actual idol, I guess you would say, in that, in that idea of what, what, what an idol is. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that most Westerners are not idolaters. See, idolatry is blind uh, or excessive devotion to something or someone. And that could be money, that could be prestige, that could be a job, that could be, uh, that could be a charismatic individual. And I believe that the, the calamity and sorrow associated with, <laughs> excuse me, with the, with the contamination of a third of the fresh water supply of the world speaks directly to the consequences of turning from God and worshiping idols. Now the fourth trumpet is then blown. These are all still in chapter 8, and it causes a third of the sun, moon, and the stars to not show their light. This may be due to all the particles that are up in the atmosphere. Now I personally believe that nuclear weapons are somehow involved in all of this, in, in this great worldwide conflict that's going on during the tribulation. As we talked about last week, that could also be biological weapons, there could also be a genetic warfare of some kind. The hail and the fire mixed with blood and also the, the trees and the grass being burned up. That sounds like the result of this kind of incredible churning of the elements of the earth. The blazing mountain thrown into the sea and the star that falls on a third of the rivers, those sound a lot like meteors. So these trumpet judgments are, are close-ups of what was going on with the seals. We're, we're zooming in and things seem so terrible yet there's still more trumpets to be blown. And with chapter 9, the fifth and the sixth trumpets are sounded, and things again escalate. With the fifth trumpet, the text speaks of Satan, the fallen angel who has given keys to the abyss, the place of detention of the wickedest angels. And he opens the abyss, and smoke billows out, darkening the sun and the air as if a great volcano has erupted. And with the smoke comes demonic locusts that fly and sting, People will desire to die because of the pain, yet they will not be able to. And that goes on for five months. The Bible refers to this as the first woe with still two more to go. Also in chapter 9 comes the sixth trumpet. This brings a voice from beyond the four horns of the golden altar that is before the throne of God. This altar was the altar of incense where burning incense poured uh, pictured the prayers of the saints rising up to God. And God answers those prayers. And four angels that are bound at the Euphrates are released, and a great army kills a third of mankind. And incredibly, we find that those who remain alive on the earth do not repent, which lines up with the opening of the sixth seal. So then, 
after that excessive review, we come today to chapter 10 in our study of this amazing book. And with chapter 10, kind of like we did with chapter 7, we have kind of an interlude that, that lasts for all of chapter 10 and a little over uh, half of chapter 11 before we get to the seventh trumpet. Now, as we have observed already, with each new series of judgments, we're, we're zooming in from panorama to snapshots. And in the next few chapters, we'll just be in chapter 10 today, but in the next few chapters, we meet the individuals, the forces, and the institutions that emerge to struggle with each other and with God. And we're that much closer to the closing of history to moving on to the next part of of God's plan. Now here in chapter 10, some very interesting things take place. John mysteriously eats a book or a scroll. And then in chapter 11, we move on to the two witnesses. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's let's pray and then we'll we'll dig into the text here. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, that you have breathed freshly fresh breath into our lungs lord that that you've given us our next breath our next heartbeat um lord you are are you are our creator um you are compassionate you are merciful you are slow to anger you you are abounding in steadfast love and and in faithfulness and lord we ask that as we enter into this study of your word that you would give us wisdom and grant us understanding we pray this in jesus name amen All right, so chapter 10, picking up with verse 1. It says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. So this is the beginning of that supplementary section that I mentioned and it's included here, the supplementary section is included here to clear up some things that have already been said. And, and, and the section will continue through verse 14 of chapter 11. Now, this section doesn't really move us forward. It presents us with facts contributing to the, the full prophetic scene of the end times events. In verse 1 of chapter 10, we have another person introduced. And that person is described as another mighty angel. But before that, in the New King James Version, we have that word still. It says still another. And even before that, we have a word that the New King James Version actually leaves untranslated. And that Greek word is kia, meaning and and both. Now, the New King James Version and the uh, New American Standard Bible, they choose not to translate that word, while most other translations do include it. And the reason is that it conveys a sense of of continued action or motion forward in this vision. And so other translations use and or even then, then I saw and I saw. Um, I prefer kind of having it there because it is in the original text. It's part of the original text and it's used that way. So um, just know that it is uh, that what we're reading here, while it's supplemental, it is a continuation of the vision, right? This is something that John, that, that John is seeing next in his vision. Now, along the same lines, the, the New King James Version word still, it is not in the text. And, and perhaps the New King James Version adds it to make up for the missing then at the beginning, but it's more likely that the word still was added to clarify that word another. The Greek term used here for another is specific, and it means another of the same kind. So then the New King James Version using the word still seems to point back to the former angels while noting that this angel is also distinct from the former angels. This means that he is not the sixth angel from chapter 9, 
the last one to, to blow uh, a trumpet in the series of, of trumpet judgments. This is another angel. Yet also not just another angel. This angel has some interesting features. Features of divinity. For instance, verse 1 describes him as being clothed with a cloud. Now in the Old Testament, it is only God who comes in heaven or uh, to earth in a cloud. Back in chapter 4, we mentioned God's descent on, on Mount Sinai being similarly described as John's vision of God's throne. Um, there in, in verse 5 of chapter 4, it says, From the throne proceeded lightnings, thundering, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. Well, we again look back to the Lord descending on Sinai. In Exodus 19, uh, verse 9, the Lord described himself coming to Moses in a thick cloud. Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. Exodus 19 goes on to describe the Lord descending in a thick cloud and in fire uh, announced by thunder and the sounding of a, a trumpet. And this is a pattern that we see here. Clouds, thunders, um, sounding of trumpets. As we saw with the throne room of God earlier in Revelation, also on Mount Sinai. And we might also think of how during Israel's wilderness wanderings, God dwelt among the nation in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Additionally, from Exodus to the historical books, to the prophets and the Psalms, God is described as being in a cloud. And we have in Daniel 7, where the future Messiah is described as coming with the clouds of heaven. And then, of course, Jesus speaking of the end times in Matthew 24, he himself said, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So without the text outright saying it, we can, I think, conclude that this angel is the person who is also referred to as the angel of the Lord several times in the Old Testament. Now, we see Jesus appear multiple times in the Old Testament in what is called a Christophany. That is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. Um, we see these Christophanies in, in, Gen in Genesis 16, 22, Exodus 2, uh, no, Exodus 3, uh, Exodus 14, uh, Judges 2, uh, Judges 6, Judges 13, Zechariah 3, um, several times in, in Daniel and so forth. Um, now, since the Son of Man in Revelation 1 is clearly Jesus, and then also based on the imagery of Daniel 7, the mighty angel clothed with a cloud should also be identified with the angel of the Lord. Not, not everyone sees it this way. Some see this, this figure as an angel to whom has been given great power and authority. Now, in this case, it could be that this angel is the strong angel of chapter 5, the one who, who asked, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? There, there are many instances in Revelation where angels are made ministers of God and given Tremendous power and tremendous authority. But I believe the textual evidence um, within all of Scripture here, as we, look, as we just went back and kind of mapped it out, I believe that textual evidence reveals that this is most likely Jesus. Now, we talked about the clouds. There's also the imagery of the rainbow on his head. And that's reminiscent of Ezekiel 1, where the glory of the Lord is described as being like a rainbow. And his face, like the sun, takes us back to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, where the text says his face shone like the sun. Now, we saw the same imagery in chapter 1 of this very letter, where Jesus' countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Um, I think we dealt with the pillars of fire pretty well earlier, so let's continue through the text. Verse 2 also says that he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left upon the earth. And this implies a position of power and authority over all the earth. But what seems to stand out the most here is that in his hand is a, a little scroll. A Biblia Redion. Little scroll. Now, Biblia Redion is derived from the word Biblion, which means scroll. 
In fact, biblion is the word uh, that we saw in chapter 5 in regards to the scroll sealed with seven seals, which Christ then proceeded to break open. And then we'll see, as we continue, that the idea of seals and being sealed up appears in this chapter as well. But, but whether or not this is the same scroll as before is, is unclear. If the intent is that this is the same scroll, that it seems that this is just a portion of that scroll. As Bibliaridion can speak of a scroll section. Now, Ezekiel prophesying about the, the Jewish exiles in Babylon, Ezekiel had a vision, a portion of which he described in this way. Now, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. It was unusual for a scroll to be written on inside and outside, front and back. But that is the case with the scroll in Ezekiel, and also in Revelation chapter 5. There's, there's nothing here in chapter 10 saying this little scroll is written on inside and out. So this scroll is little or a portion of a larger scroll, and it might, not, might or might not be written on both sides. I don't think we can definitely say this is the same scroll from chapter 5. It might be. After all, it's, it's been opened. But it also might not be. I think the best way to look at this is that since it is Jesus who is holding it, and he's the one who opened the scroll of chapter 5, this little scroll is different, but somehow closely related. Now, whatever the case, nowhere in Revelation are we told the contents of this little scroll. And John does not receive the little scroll until uh, later in this chapter. Now, as John watches the vision uh, of the angel, the angel shouts, cries out, Kratzo, uh, that's the lemma, Ekraxen is the manuscript form, form of that word. The word means shout, scream, and cry out. His voice is described as loud, like the mighty roar of a lion. Uh, David wrote in Psalm 29 that the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. In fact, Psalm 29 speaks of the voice of the Lord in seven different ways. Psalm 29 says the voice of the Lord is over the waters, that it's powerful, that it's full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord strikes with flaming fire, shakes the wilderness, and bends the large trees. Now, Jewish literature outside of the Bible, outside of the biblical text, spoke of thunder as the seven voices. And so we might have a connection with the seven thunders and the voices of verse 4. But altogether, it, it really seems a, it seems a mystery. And, and the things the voices say are intended to be left a mystery. Sealed up, not written down. Now the voices are obviously understandable to John, but he's told not to record what they say. And this is a, it, it, well, it's a mystery to us. And, and while many teachers and commentators have tried to offer up explanations of, of what the voices must have said, none of them are really suitable explanations. It's just all wild speculation. Now, given the context of the utterances, it would make sense for them to be aspects of God's wrath at, uh, at the time that, that are just not for us to be known now. Now, another question is if he's not going to tell us what the seven thunders spoke, then why even bring it up? Why even mention it? It's like, it's like somebody saying, I know something that you don't, I'm not going to tell you. You know, it just, just bothers you. And perhaps the reason is, perhaps it's simply just for us to know that while we're being told much, we're not being told everything. There are secrets in this whole prophetic scenario. And because of this, we should be very careful in our exposition so that we do not add to or take away from this prophecy. Perhaps we simply can't handle what the uh, seven thunders said. And there's precedence for that in Scripture. Jesus said in John 16, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And Moses told the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. 
But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. It's always, it's always very interesting to dig into those things that are, are hinted at in Scripture or not explicitly revealed in Scripture. Deep Bible study can be very productive. Scripture says, For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And it may or may not be granted to us, though, to understand everything. And we can, we can be okay with that. Second Peter 1 tells us that God has given, us, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So while there might be some things that we don't understand, God is making sure that we do understand the important things. We, we may spend some time thinking about things that, that, uh, that we would consider to be divine mysteries. But at the same time, we should not put undue focus on what God has chosen not to reveal. Instead, we should focus on what God has revealed. God has a reason for not revealing all things. And perhaps his reason is to, to leave room for faith. We can have faith in his written word, and we can have faith in him. Romans 8.28 does not say we see all things working together for good. But rather, we know that all things work together for good. See, faith has its reward. And we will one day have all the knowledge that, that we lack now. As Paul wrote to the, the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 13, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants, the prophets. All right, so raising up the heaven, we would all probably recognize as a gesture for taking an oath. Uh, the text here should read right hand. That was the custom. So some would say that this act of swearing an oath by God indicates that the angel in this vision must not be Christ. But, but Scripture is full of instances where the Lord swears by Himself. There's no one higher, there's no higher power for Him to swear by. Consider what the author of Hebrews wrote in chapter 6, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And, and for uh, uh, another kind of four instance here for you, one that's very pertinent to our study, in an oath by God that he will judge the ungodly, God says in Deuteronomy 32, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, nor is there any who can deliver from my hand, for I raise my hand to heaven and say, As I live forever, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. The word of Deuteronomy 32 even seems to be predictive of the wording here. Only in Deuteronomy 32, the Lord uses the word if. And here in Revelation 10, is that there is no more time, no more delay. In fact, the literal translation is, that time no longer shall be. In other words, there is a predetermined time in the future when God's purpose for history will be completed. And things in the tribulation are about to escalate to that conclusion. Now, I believe that this is a, a reference to Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, where an angel lifted his right hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that there would only be three and a half more years until the end. That text reads this way, Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever 
that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So I believe this marks the midpoint of the tribulation when the two witnesses will be killed and resurrected along with the, de- the desecration of the temple. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, the text says the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So we get the sense here that some great mystery is about to be accomplished. The, the word uh, in Greek is mysterion. Now, the Septuagint, that is the, the Greek translation of the New Testament, um, frequently uses that word in the book of Daniel. And the word is used about 22 times in the New Testament. But I want to draw your attention to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verses 9 through 10, says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In Scripture, a mystery is not like what we would think of as a, uh, a whodunit, like, like Sherlock or uh, Monk, if you remember Monk, or Agatha Christie books, if you go even further back. Um, A mystery in Scripture is a divine truth that has not been revealed or that is just being revealed. There are always two elements of a New Testament mystery. First, it cannot be discovered by regular human means because it is always a revelation from God. And secondly, it is revealed at the proper time and often enough is revealed to establish the facts without all the details. It's generally accepted that 11 mysteries are revealed in the New Testament, but still God has not told us everything. And someday God will reveal them to us, but not until it is time. Yet we do have a hint here in our text. In verse 7, the mystery is said to have been declared to his servants, the prophets. So then it is in some way unfolded in the pages of the Old Testament. And I believe that this mystery is related to the establishment of Christ's millennial kingdom and the eternity that will follow thereafter. So then, Scripture such as Isaiah 9, 6-7 may pertain to this mystery. Isaiah 9 says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So while speaking of his first incarnation, The bulk of the prophecy looks forward to the second coming of the Messiah when he will rule. But there's more that I believe makes up a part of this mystery, and that is this, in Daniel 7. (coughs) Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Christ will rule... And the saints, that is, those who have believed on him for salvation, will rule with him. Other scriptures tell us more about this time in Isaiah 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore that speaks of the millennial reign of christ 
During the thousand-year period following the tribulation, Israel will be the superpower of the world, the leading nation in all of the earth. And at the center of Israel will be the mountain of the Lord's house, the Temple Mount, which will be the capital of the government of the Messiah. And further to that, uh, Jeremiah 31 says, No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. So not only is this mystery pertaining to Christ's millennial kingdom, but also to the fact that this present age's ignorance of God and and, and our disregard for his majesty will exist no more when Christ returns. In that day, everyone will know the Lord. That is, they will know the important facts about him. But as we'll see, they're not forced into salvation. And many will rebel once Satan is released from the pit. And we'll talk about that more, of course, later on in our study of Revelation. Verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me according, uh, spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth, So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. The voice which the Apostle John heard from heaven. This points back to verse 4. John heard a voice from heaven after he heard the seven thunders. The source of the voice is not revealed. But it's interesting that when the speaker is referenced in verse 11, it isn't, but it should be translated as plural. It's the Greek word lego, meaning say and tell but the manuscript form of the word what you would find if you were actually looking at the manuscript is plural it's in its plural form and should be rendered they said so then it might not be god the father or god the son or god the holy spirit who is speaking but rather all three speaking as one and the voice instructs john to take the small scroll which is open in the hand of the angel from before and for a third time we are told that this angel stands on the sea and on the earth. Each time the sea is mentioned before the earth. It's interesting to note that the normal order in the book of Revelation is for earth to be mentioned before the sea. We we see that in chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 12, and chapter 14. And this this change of that form likely tells us that that John was impressed that the, the angel had his foot on the sea. But the symbolism is of authority over all the situation on the planet. But it it really emphasizes the Lord's authority because while man might feel more comfortable on the earth, might be able to be more in control of things that are going on on land, when it comes to the sea, much less do we have control. But the Lord has absolute control over all the earth. Now, in obedience to the voice, John goes to the angel and asks for the scroll. And the angel responds by instructing John to do something perhaps unexpected with it. Take and eat it. There are parallels in Scripture to this eating of a scroll, and we find those in Ezekiel 2 as well as Jeremiah 15. And these texts make it clear that by eating the book, John partakes of its contents, but also seizes upon its message. In this, it seems that the scroll is symbolically the word of God as it has been delivered to men, life-sustaining and sweet to the believer. The, The word that John is told to consume has a message that is to be proclaimed, and it's a message that's for the whole world. And it is a bittersweet message for John to deliver as it was for Ezekiel. Now, 
the Apostle John didn't actually eat the scroll. Remember, he's in a vision here. And it's in that vision that God caused him to be able to eat the scroll. And just like in Ezekiel, the message which John has taken into himself to deliver to others has had a twofold effect. Predicted by the sweetness in his mouth and the bitterness in his stomach. Partaking of the word of God is sweet. Psalm 19 says, um, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they are than, than more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. It, it's the word of promise, the word of grace, it's a revelation of the love of God, precious assurance of eternal salvation and the basis for our present fellowship with Christ. But this sweet word of God also has aspects of bitterness in that it reveals divine judgments which will be poured out on the earth. God prepared heaven, but also created the lake of fire for the devil and his angels. It wasn't created for people, yet because of sin... That is where people will be put to, put to suffer if they refuse Jesus. Now, the invitation to John to, to partake of the little book and, and eat is the invitation of God to all who would participate in the blessing of the Word of God. Certainly for all Christians, there, there are trials, there are afflictions, but at the same time, there is eternal blessing when the Lord returns for His own. The, the troubles that, that you personally know and endure now, they are merely the prelude to an eternal blessing, the fulfillment of God's grace to all those who trust in Christ. It's far better to trust in Jesus now. The Bible says that God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in, in Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then verse 13, as I love to, to remind us all, says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, to wait any longer than, than today is just plain foolish. For Jesus may return for his church at any time, and, and then the time that we have been studying, the tribulation, is at hand. And yes, there will be those who will receive the gospel during the time of the tribulation. In fact, they will, uh, there will be many who will run from judgment right into the arms of Christ. But what is true, yet likely seems incredible to us as we study through these things, is that as we get closer to the end, and we'll see this in the text, men's hearts will grow colder and colder, harder and harder. And we think that... that People's hearts are, are hardened now. But according to the last chapter, even when the evidence of God's judgment is impossible to, de to deny, according to chapter 9 we saw last week, people will refuse to repent. But God continues to speak. And during this time, as we'll see next week, He raises up two special witnesses to share the bittersweet truth of God's Word. Again, we'll see those two witnesses next week. This is where we're going to stop for this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your love. We thank You for Your grace. We thank You for Your mercy. Your name is holy. and Lord, we pray that Your name would would be holy in all the earth to all people, to all nations. Lord, we desire your kingdom. We desire to do your will. You have provided to us. We know that you will continue to provide according to our needs. And we thank you. Lord, in the way that you love us, we ask that you would teach us to love one another as you've forgiven us. Help us to be forgiving of one another. And Lord, help us to have our treasures in heaven rather than seeking after ourselves here on the earth. 
We ask that you would establish us in all of your good things. Guard our hearts, Lord. Keep our minds from temptation. Keep our hands from evil. Protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. And Lord, we thank you even though we go through trials. We thank you in that you grow us in our trials and you mature us through trials. And Lord, I pray that you would be glorified as we go through trials. Lord, we thank you that you are a great high priest. Lord, we place ourselves before you to do your will. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior, everyone said, Amen.